Well, this is certainly a question that keeps me up all night. So 2024 is absolutely bursting at the seams with the Love Live content, with season three of Superstar and the Nijikazaki films being right around the corner. So I thought to myself, why not let loose and talk about my bread and butter again? So if it isn't obvious by the title, I'll be scientifically breaking down Love Live's third and fourth generations and answering the age old question of which group is Yurier. And an obvious question I might get is why the hell am I not including Muse and Aqua? And an obvious answer is that is a really stupid question. School Idol idle project and sunshine were merely experimenting, dipping their toes in the shallow end of the Yuri pool. Whereas Nijigazaki and Liela take the floaties off and dive headfirst into the deep end without a swimsuit. And today I'll be covering all those notable canon moments and giving a concise and objective breakdown on both groups' Yuriness. This also means that I'll only cover the anime, so anything that involves the groups in games, manga, or IRL is completely moot. And yes, this also means I'll include Nijion. I know people tend to forget that one. All right, let's get cracking, shall we? So let's start with my personal favorite Love Live group, which will in no way impact my decision, by the way. I just want to make that clear. So the first thing that we're greeted with is our main couple, Uruhara Yumu and Takasaki Yu, going on one of their usual dates, and plenty of flirting ensues. I have to say, I was pretty surprised by how blatant some of the interactions were, specifically the finger licking scene. I don't know if this is meant to be an obvious bit of wink wink fan service, or a casual thing friends in Japan do for each other. But getting some food off someone's face and graciously slurping it up might just constitute a as a form of foreplay. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I don't remember hearing a lot of people talking about this specific scene when it aired, so maybe it is a super nonchalant thing. Anyway, the important thing about Yupomu's introduction is that these two are inseparable, and Ayumu in particular considers every minute spent with her soulmate as valuable, to the point where she couldn't bear not having her by her side. In case your eyes were closed, the A-plot as it were of Season 1 and the end of Season 2 of Nichikazaki is basically Ayumu and Yu reconciling with each other about having to be apart when pursuing their dreams. I mean, love Live is certainly no stranger to friendship drama, but this feels like a whole different slice of the pie, especially with how much focus we've been getting on how devastated Yumu would be if she lost you, and how much physical pain she's in when you shows even the slightest interest towards other girls. By the way, here's a montage of all of them from season one. <laughs> さすがスクールアイドルこんなに可愛くて料理までできるんだえそうかなうん誰が見たって可愛いよスクールアイドルの自己紹介うわ見てたまで見たときめいたよかすみちゃんえいろんな可愛いもかっこいいも一緒にい
I almost forgot what the point of this video was. Then all hell breaks loose when Yu invites a Yumu to her room, and we get to witness a pivotal point of love life and Yuri history as a whole. After expressing how sexually frustrated she was, and something about not wanting Yu to leave her side, a Yumu gives her a good old friendship tackle onto her bed, and proceeded to utter the most important piece of dialogue known to man. <laughs> If you were to try to convince me that this scene was anything but romantic in nature, by giving me electric shock therapy for five years, while also squeezing my balls in an iron vice, I would still say you're huffing some massive amounts of copium. Honestly, if it wasn't for that cliche interruption, these two might have been mashing potatoes right about now. Now, admittedly, the way they followed up this mighty bombshell in the next episode leaves much to be desired. It doesn't close the romance route completely, but it does feel like a lazy response to such a significant series of events. The two reaffirm their relationship and promise that no matter how far apart they are or where life will take them they will always be friends in the end curse that blasted word but again this doesn't mean the door is closed or anything the feelings are all there they just didn't manage to spill out in the way we at least hoped they would through a love confession or a passionate smooch for example then after a bit of a lull the showrunners give us a full course meal in season 2 episode 5 we start with you turning a yumu down when she asks her out on another date and when our dear bunny girl goes off on her own she spots the harem queen herself getting buddy buddy with Shizuku, which immediately sets off a Yumu's jealous mode. Thank god the writers remember something called continuity. So as a Yumu and Setsuna stalk you and Shizuku, we were given another Scooby snack when Shizuku explains to us her fantastic new fan fiction. It's Beauty and the Beast, with a Yumu as Belle and Setsuna as the sexy beast. It even comes with role reversal, because even Shizuku knows that a Yumu and Setsuna are flexible tops and bottoms. Damn, girl! And while we're on the subject of a Yumu and Setsuna, let's take a little detour by quickly mentioning their not-so-subtle episode from Season 2 of Nijion. Both girls share an umbrella. Setsuna compliments a Yumu's intoxicating sweet scent. Setsuna brags about you fangirling all over her. A Yumu starts getting jealous. And in a shocking twist, it turns out a Yumu wasn't jealous that you was fawning over Setsuna, but that she wanted to fawn over Setsuna too. <laughs> Never mind. I guess the writers did forget about continuity. But in all seriousness, I think this episode was simply to show that there was no bad blood between a Yumu and Setsuna, and to toss Ayu Setsu Shepherds a bone. Any of them here right now? How's your day going? Anyway, back to the main anime. So when the four girls gather to talk about the reason they came to the amusement park, we get a rare instance of a character blatantly saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> The episode then came full circle with a Yuma and Yu going on their date as promised. And quite honestly, I was really expecting it to end with a sudden kiss from a Yumu. I mean, the setting and move were perfect. Just look at that shot, too. The writers knew exactly what they were trying to do here, as the romance between these two was still going strong. And the only next step we have yet to reach is an actual kiss. Maybe they're saving that for the films. And lastly, they share a short but sweet moment in Season 2, Episode 10, where once again we will get these two alone together in an ideal situation to finally lock lips. It's also another case of the writers playing the not-so-subtle-subtle game. I, I understood that reference. Now moving on from a Yuma and Yu, the next Yuri thing to occur in the anime was in episode 3, where we get plenty of flirting between Yu and her second most prominent harem member, Setsuna. Basically, Yu gushes over Setsuna's raw idol power while getting super physical, which causes the small hottie to get all flustered. Emotions run high too as Yu lights a fire under Setsuna again, making their embrace that much more romantic. And speaking of embrace, I know it was just an accident used to set up a Yumu's wrath, but their scene in episode 10 was a full own instruction manual for writing two characters who are supposed to be in love. There's no way to look at it any differently. Both girls are alone in a music room that's illuminated by moonlight. They share a heartfelt conversation. They walk back together, and Setsuna trips and passionately falls into Yu's arms. I'm actually amazed Setsuna was able to fight the urge to suck Yu's lips right then and there. Here's a little thought experiment for you. Try to picture this scene playing exactly the same way it did, but with different characters instead. Specifically a male and female character. Do you think the writers would 
would be brain dead enough to just let that whole thing slide? Or would they pursue this endeavor and see this whole thing through? My point is, this is as blatant of a romantic flag as it gets. And my disappointment is later exasperated when it turns out this will be the final chapter to the Yu Setsu ship, as they barely even interacted with each other after that. But moving on from this sour taste, let's talk about something a little sweet. Part way into season one, we've got Emma and Karin at full force. And while we do get little moments that showed us that Karin was very eager to help her Swiss girlfriend, we knew that she was not being completely honest yet. After finding out that Karin was really into the whole school idol thing, but that it didn't really suit her image, Emma took her out on a surprise date and let her spill her emotions out. We then get a nice reassuring hug from Emma who wanted to see her number one doing the things that make her happy. And in episode nine, we got Karin showing just how much she appreciates Emma's support by singing almost certainly a love song for her. So much rainbow colors. Now on the lighter end of the scale, we do get some cute moments from one of my favorite ships, Rena and I, but their interactions could very well fall under the subtexty camp. I just thought I'd mention it because it'd be weird if I didn't. Alright, so let's wrap up the main ships by talking about the Kasmi and Shizuku moments in episode 8. In the shock of the century, we agreed with Kasmi doing the impossible. Worry about someone that wasn't her. But seriously, she could tell her sweetie was suffering from a case of identity crisis, and followed up by reassuring her that she had nothing to be ashamed of by being her genuine, lovely self. And you know what else? <laughs> There's the L word again. Now, of course, Love Life has surprised us before with sudden confessions, but unlike Chika and Riko, Nijikazaki didn't sully the waters in the following season. Kasumi and Shizuku were still intact, unfortunately, with not too many interactions in season two. Alright, since I couldn't fit it into the video naturally, I'm just gonna rapid fire through all the notable Yuri moments from Nijion that I haven't talked about yet. Yu tells Longju and I that they're cute, and everyone in the room blushes at their oblivious queen after she turned them on with her charm. Yu stares lovingly at Ayumu while she practices and turns her on with her charm. You thanks Setsuna for introducing her to the world of idols, which causes Setsuna to blush, and they're immediately interrupted by a jealous Ayumu, after both girls were turned on by her charm. Karin practices her sexy chin grab on Setsuna, and turns her on with her charm. Rina and Emma nuzzle up to each other, and later do the same thing for their girlfriends, and Diver Diva were turned on by their charm. You literally flirts with everyone in the idol club, and like the absolute harem protagonist Chad that she is, turns them all on with her charm. So can Liela top Nijikazaki's gay streak? Let's find out. Now admittedly, season one of Superstar was pretty dry on the Yuri, but I did set up two of the biggest Liela ships. Well, let's start with the Kanan and Chisato moments. It's pretty clear that Chisato looks up to Kanan a great deal, thanks to the orange haired cutie giving her the confidence she needed when she was a timid young lass. Feeling immense gratitude towards her, we say numerous times how Chisato treats her soulmate, salivating over her beauty, cheering on her success, and pushing her body to the absolute limits to stand on the same level as her. This culminates in them having finger sex and an emotional hug. I know this could be construed as a very close friendship moment, but with how far Chisato in particular is willing to go to preserve her friend's happiness, that line starts to become blurry. Just a reminder, Chisato encouraged Kanon to level up her singing talents twice, one time to finally overcome her stage fright, and the other to pursue her dream in Vienna, since she knew that Kanon would have done the same for her. It's kind of the opposite to a Yuma and Yu's drama, actually, but equally deep-seated in love. Oh, Oh, and I also can't forget that very subtle piece of symbolism in episode 6. Next, we got Sumi Cuckoo, who you could say stole the show entirely with her quirky bickering slash flirting. Right off the bat, the writers make their intent clear by showing us a very shocking preview of episode 5, where we see a quick clip of Subinari giving Cuckoo what looks to be a smooch on the cheek. And it's safe to say that Love Life fans were in hysterics for the entire week. Then when the episode rolled around, we find out that it was just a naughty little bit of ear blowing to distract Cuckoo. <laughs> But make no mistake, this is definitely framed as a Yuri moment, albeit one we weren't expecting. They could have written Sumire doing anything else to drop Cuckoo's guard, but they made her do something pretty much only people in relationships would do. Try casually blowing into someone's ear and see if they think you're seducing them. But don't do it on a stranger, that's a good way to get you slapped in handcuffs. Anyway, following this, the Sumire couple end up sleeping in the same bed, and Sunny Passion playfully tease them, mentioning how close they are. Oh, they sure are. Now with episode 10, we basically have the two acknowledging their soonderiness, but with the added bonus of being on a first name basis. 
progress. And jumping ahead, we got another Sundere Supernova in Season 2, Episode 9, where Sumire pulls out all the stops to keep her dear Cuckoo from leaving. And what follows is the closest the anime has ever been to seeing the characters reach first base. With all the high-running emotions and the way the shots are framed, it honestly seemed like Cuckoo was ready to plant a passionate wet one on Sumire. But despite the perfect opportunity, the writers decided once again to pull the rug underneath us part way, and have them hug instead. But I'm not gonna undersell the scene here. It was pitch perfect and very well executed, and the cherry on top was Cuckoo giving a classic Sundari love confession, solidifying their destiny together. Now before we move on to the best Yuri ship of all time, here are a couple of random Yuri moments I need to mention. In episode 11, we were given an inexplicable treat where Ren stumbled upon a rather saucy Link. We see two women passionately gazing into each other's eyes, with the words Forbidden World next to them. Now this is either a timeshare scam of some fictional property, or a lesbian porn site. Either way, it caused Ren to lose all of her innocence that day. Now joking aside, I find it funny that this is the first on-screen recognition of lesbians in the Love Live anime universe. Despite the ridiculous context, it was so random and blatant that I couldn't help but laugh out loud. They even continued the joke in Season 2, by briefly showing these two again doing a little performance. It may not have been a porn site, but it's safe to say that the context itself was slightly naughty. Anyway, let's finish this off with Shiki and Mei's earth-shattering debut. Now before Season 2 even began, fans of the show would notice tidbits that shone a light on their relationship, such as Shiki's character description having one of her likes being Mei. So the showrunners pretty much gave us a ready-made ship before the season even aired. And naturally, I was somewhat skeptical of this result in very little- すっかり夢中、号泣。何勝手に撮ってんだよ。すごく可愛かった。可愛いとかじゃない。顔真っ赤だぞ。それは平気。メイは可愛いから。お前の方が可愛いだろ。可愛くない。可愛い。言わないで
honestly, I think I might have missed a few notable scenes between them. Their romance was essentially one of the show's driving forces. I mean, if you can name some potential themes on the anime, it'd be hard to write off Yuri as one. Add on top all the other Yuri moments, and the fact that season one is basically a series of short stories of characters receiving help from their girlfriends, and you're left with an anime that very much has Yuri as a top priority. I also can't overlook the writers intentionally or unintentionally making you a Yuri harem protagonist. I mean, it's goddamn brilliant. So yeah, a hard-fought battle between two juggernauts. But in the end, I believe the crown has to go to Nijigazaki for its sheer firepower and intense focus on girls pining for other girls. Let me know what you think. Am I full of wisdom or full of crap? Regardless, we're gonna see lots more of both Nijigazaki and Liela soon. And I have the utmost confidence that they'll step up their game once again. At this rate, it's only a matter of time before some of the characters get to first base. Incidentally, my money is on one of these three. Place your bets, folks. Anyway, I'm gonna end it here before my lungs collapse. Feel free to give me a like or something. It'd be much appreciated. Anyway, see you around.